I'm Alison Burns. I've been teaching at Trishti in Bangalore for, this is my seventh school year, so I've been here for six years, and I mostly enjoy teaching classes around image making. Hi, and I'm Kumkum Nadig. I have been at Trishti since past 13 years now. I have been heading the visual communication design program at uh, undergraduate level as well as at postgraduate level. And um, this year I've also taken on the role of the Dean of the School of Design, Business and Technology. So, vision is the most primary sense through which we perceive and interact with our world today. Uh, vision is a sense, in fact it's the only sense, that extends farthest from our own body. Um, technically speaking, our eyes will be able to see up to a distance of three miles if there are no obstructions on the way, of course. Hearing comes next because we can't hear someone talking three miles away, but perhaps we can hear someone talking just two rooms away. And then comes a sense of smell which extends just a few feet beyond our bodies. Maybe just the room is filled with a perfume of something. And the senses of touch and taste are activated only when they are very, very close to our body or in our body, correct? Um, the sense of vision can actually tell us many, many things. You must be wondering why I'm showing you a dosa on a plate. But if you look at it closely, let's look at the, the top right slide, uh, top right picture. Um, most of you would agree with me that this dosa looks most crispy than the other two dosas, right? And we haven't touched it, we haven't tasted it, we haven't even put it in our mouth and yet we can tell that it is crispy dosa. We can also perhaps tell that the masala is wrapped inside the dosa um, simply because we can't see it outside in one of the containers surrounding the dosa. If you look at the top left image, you can perhaps tell that that dosa looks a bit soft, much softer than the dosa on the right. Uh, whereas the dosa at the bottom looks cold. Why? Because the butter, even though it is on top of the dosa, hasn't melted yet. So, in a very simple manner, I'm trying to tell you that vision is a very, very primary way we can make sense of the world around us. So the course is primarily about learning to see, observe and look and then create visual messages that evoke a specific or desired response. The process of seeing, observing and looking uses principles of perception and cognition and the process of creating uses principles of design thinking. Employing the principles of cognition, perception and design thinking to create ideas and experiences with textual and visual content can actually be defined as graphic communication or graphic design, correct? Now let's look at a definition uh, given to us by AIGA, that is the American Institute of Gra Graphic Arts. AIGA says that graphic design, also known as communication design, is the art and practice of planning and projecting ideas and experiences with visual and textual content. I wonder whether this definition works rather at a rudimentary level. Um, perhaps we can find a more appropriate definition, Alison? Yeah, we can look around and here's just one example that we found earlier today which we thought works a little bit better, which is that graphic design is the most universal of all the arts. So. Mm -hmm. Of course, we're, we're, in the, we're in the field, so we think it's very important. Yeah. It is all around us, explaining, decorating, identifying, imposing meaning on the world. Without graphic design's process and ingredients, structure and organization, word and image, we would have to receive all of our information by the spoken word, like in thousands of years ago. Correct. Um, so, what will you learn in, in the Graphic Arts and Design uh, Practices program? You will definitely learn the, the ability to give form to an idea. You know, something, you have an idea, but then I, that idea needs to be realized. It needs to be given a form. Uh, it could be a graphic form, it could be any other form. Secondly, you will understand 
how images can embody and communicate meaning. Um, images are not for the sake of making things look pretty, making things look interesting. Images are created by a designer just so that they communicate a specific meaning. They can sometimes the, be intentionally ugly. Exactly, mm -hmm. yes. You can make something intentionally ugly and, and maybe make a point. Uh, articulation of own creative voice through words and own creative work. You don't want your work to look like another designer's work. And so, so personal voice is very, very important for a designer. Recontextualizing information and inputs and adapting them to give new expressions. We all are looking for new things. Um, it's, it's an inherent human condition that, that we are attracted to new things. And so new expressions is, is very crucial for our work. Uh, working effectively with other people within real world constraints. It's important to collaborate. Without teamwork, you really cannot work on large projects. And lastly, simplifying complex information and distilling it into a message understood by a particular audience. We have uh, a collection of um, typographic posters here to share with you. Um, these fall under the ability to uh, give form to an idea. The students were asked to create um, a font based on some aspect of Bangalore City. So you see the poster on the left has created a font um, um, visualizing slang of Bangalore. So whatever popular slang words that are used in Bangalore City. And the poster on the right actually uh, visualizes different uh, petes of Bangalore. In Kannada, pete means a small market. And initially Bangalore City was constructed around these small markets. And just because we tend to work on computers a lot nowadays, because it's easy to fix your mistakes or you know try new things in a very fast, that does not mean that designers are not still very enthusiastic and constantly using hand techniques. So this is a collage, also spelling out Bangalore using the bus tickets that are found all over the city. Yeah, all the work doesn't have to be created on the computer. So in this class, and all the images we're showing are actual products and. Uh, projects that Trishti students have done was to use the screen printing studio workshop and we have several workshops that students like to get their hands dirty with at Trishti. This one was to use screen printing and you can see the screen at the top left is how a screen is made and then you put ink on it and squeeze it through to make a pattern or a word and this, this wasn't also just about finding how to use screen printing, it was also to find a context, and this one was nature, and it was about finding and sketching different inspirations from nature to come up with patterns that work together. And then they were, put to, they were used as fabric packaging for things that wouldn't normally be thought of as something packaged. So you would see something like an herb, a basil plant there on the bottom right, being packaged and you think of it in another way once it has that nice screen printed pattern around it. Another aspect of design that's very important for graphic artists and designers is to understand how images can embody and communicate meaning. So yes, we want images to look attractive, we want people to want to look at our images, but that's kind of just an extra added end result once the image is finished. While you're making it, you have to think, how will I make it so that it says something about what I'm saying? This was a project done by Shristi students where they were using photographic images to tell a story. So this one was about astral projections or kind of out-of-body experiences. So the student designed it. So you have to look at it with 3D glasses in order to fully see what is happening. And it actually pops out at you on the page. And that was a way to show his story idea and enhance it. This is another from the same class. So they're making what is called photo novellas, which are very popular in like South America, which are comic books made with photos. So this is goes to show that comics don't always have to be drawn and that, that that formula can be true of any form. It's not like something that you think of as always being done in one medium can often be done with another. So which means that to be a graphic designer I don't have to be good at drawing. No. No. Sometimes it helps even to be bad at it at the beginning because it's easier to learn more. That's true. You don't get stuck. So these students were using photos for these stories, but 
you can see that even though a machine, a, photo, a, a camera or a cell phone camera even, is often good enough, is taking the image or clicking the image, um, this, it's possible to say something by how the image looks. So you might do something to the image to help enhance your story too. So this was about these two men feeling nostalgic. So he made the photos look a certain way to enhance that message. And it's also possible to smartly recombine images and use found images. So this student for the same uh, project obviously didn't have dolphins available to model for her and she didn't have these oceanic scenes, but she used the actors, which were her friends, and took their picture and then juxtaposed these scene, them onto these scenes and then she used kind of a creative layout. Coming back to Bangalore again, um, this was a project uh, where students conducted visual inquiry into Bangalore's culture and environment. Um, the work on the left um, uh, is, is done by a student who uh, was very affected by uh, the fact that Bangalore wasn't so green as it used to be before. And uh, so it's, um, it's an illustration that combines imagery as well as typography. So if you read the pink letters in the background, they read, where are all my trees? And then that is overlapped with the um, icon of trees repeating. Um, it, it creates a very interesting visual and allows you to or makes the viewer to actually go closer and unpack some of the complexity and the layers in the image. Um, the image on the right is, is by the same student um, where um, he's making a point about the, uh, the fact that the trees are disappearing but the city is getting crowded by the day. So uh, it's, it's like people are raining, it's, it's raining people and, and there's just one singular tree standing below. And you think graphic design is always about being really clear and but here it's you, you can't see the words because he's trying to no. make a point about you can't see the trees. Yeah, yeah and there's a lot of artistic quality that is employed in this work. You know, the, there are two more examples uh, in the same project. Um, the one on the left is, a, is a more of a typographic solution. Um, the student was fascinated by the fact that um, Bangalore City Planning employed um, uh, stages, phases, uh, mains, crosses uh, to, to identify different areas. So, so this was her uh, uh, impression of Bangalore and uh, a commentary on its planning uh, structure. The one on the right is, is by a, a different student and here again she makes a commentary um, on, on disappearing trees and the trees or the skyline getting replaced by built environment um, and, and the trees going underground uh, as you can see. Another thing that is important to learn as a graphic artist is the articulation of your own creative voice through being able to speak about your work, but also being able to show it through your own creative work. Uh, yeah, as Kum Kum said at the beginning, you don't want your work in the end to look exactly like everyone else's. We may think at the beginning, I want to be like a Disney animator and we draw like Disney, but that's one way to kind of learn how to draw and then eventually you want to do your own thing. So this was a course where students were making long books uh, and they had to be non-fiction, so it had to be about a real scenario. So this student wanted to make a comment about the news in the newspaper, and he was already very good at drawing. So it was actually it can actually again be more difficult because he was, he could draw in so many different ways. How do you decide which way to draw and to be consistent with that and not going from one way to another? So all the students had to make these character studies where they put a figure into different poses and to see how they looked across in the bands from like the bottom, middle, and top are the same style but in different poses. And then this is uh, two pages from his book which was about how the news can be kind of strange and arbitrary and disturbing and this was a way for him to define like th this, these are the images I want to use so I will not get confused and use these other methods I know how to use. This was another character study for another project. 
And in this one, he at first wanted to make his character look like the one on the right, which is the most true to life, so the, the least abstract. So a big important decision in going with the visual style is how abstract should it be? How distorted from true life should it be? It doesn't always have to be exactly proportional like a real human. So he did end up, as you see, going with the most abstract. And so here the voice of the story, which is the written content or the story you think of in your head, has to enhance the voice of the pictures and vice versa. So the words and the pictures have to go together. And, and this is another character study, so and it has the kind of widest variation. So each aspect, however small, has to affects how you would read the images. So from color choice to the way the lines are drawn will change how the story comes across. And this is again two pages from her book, so she chose the one that looked more like a hand drawing with just a pen or pencil or marker. So this used hand and digital both. And in the end, so she, the book was 150 pages and it looked like it was made by the same person, even though she maybe learn something in between, it would it still look like a consistent project. Yeah, so the you know, process of visualization can begin in many different ways. Um, I'm just showing you one way that we ask the students to, to start to draw. And uh, as, I, as we said earlier, you really don't have to be able to draw really well, but you can learn to draw. And, and in learning to draw, you can actually develop your own style. Um, the students here are just asked to make doodles. You can see that there aren't, there aren't any finished drawings being made here. Um, the picture on the right, uh, you can see that the girl sitting at the back is actually drawing with her eyes closed. And the boy lying down is actually drawing with his toes. So th th this is one way to just, you know, completely immerse, immerse yourself, your entire body, into the process of visualizing. He could also be taking a nap soon. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he's wearing glasses, so I can't see his eyes, right? <laughs> um, this was a course in, in patterns and communication, and what that allowed uh, students to do is recontextualize information and inputs and adapt them to new expressions. Students were asked to look at any mundane object in their environment and use that to create a pattern. So this child has actually looked at the collapsible gates um, that she encountered every time she entered her apartment. And uh, looking at the collapsible gates, uh, she has then created a visual pattern that um, becomes very complex. So you, you can see that what emerged as the diamond as a singular unit when it was removed out of the context of the collapsible gate and juxtaposed with other diamonds of dif another, uh, different scales and, and different layering styles, um, there emerged a very different pattern. And just changing the color slightly, you see it in a completely different way. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're creating some sort of a depth also here, right? And then you move further. You actually uh, take the take the original shape, and you connect it with a different pattern, and there comes a completely new visual language. And and this is how the students learn how to create patterns. It's not it's not a process of looking at a pattern and then recreating it, but it's a process of finding patterns in your environment and then adapting those patterns to, to create new patterns. Now, the same patterns, uh, students were asked to also um, um, look at ideas of distortion, tension, you know, just so that you can learn to look at your own pattern in a different way. Um, ultimately, the, the project resulted in an illustrated so storybook. So students took the same pattern that they created right in the beginning and used that pattern to influence the way they draw um, a story. So they selected any story, here you know, the mythological story of churning the ocean, and uh, you can see how successfully the pattern has been employed here. And uh, that makes the entire illustration look so unique. And you might never mm -hmm. have come up with this at the beginning to, without going through yeah, the other steps. Yeah, so, so the process is so important here. 
this is one more page from that same book. <clears throat> so a lot of time when we're starting out too, we just, you know, go to the net or look at famous artists that we like and then we copy their style. So that's one way to learn. But then when we're creating new expressions, it's important to always bring it back to yourself. So this was a project where the student had to make a poster in an Art Nouveau style. And that's... Some, Do we some... know Art Nouveau, what that is? It's from uh, like uh, just about a hundred years ago and it usually just has kind of flowing florals and women with long hair, which becomes part of the pattern. But interesting here, interestingly here, the student took figures and probably specific flowers and um, the cinnamon sticks from her own environment and used them in a way that an Art Nouveau artist might have, but the original Art Nouveau artist didn't have access to figures and like this, like this person. So it's created something new. The next capability, working effectively with other people within real world constraints, collaborating. Um, <clears throat> Very few projects of graphic design take shape in isolation, right? You, you, very few times you'll be working single-handedly on one project from starting to finishing. Collaboration is the key to successful work in any area of design. Um, this was a project offered to Swishti students by two different NGOs uh, who worked actively in the Andaman Nicobar region. And they wanted us to design a book um, illustrate and design a book called The Treasured Islands. Um, students worked, um, about 20 students worked under the guidance of three faculty members. Um, <clears throat> although there were nearly 20 students working on this project um, and each student comes with his or her own unique style of working, unique style of illustration, unique style of design, but the book had to contain something that was consistent and coherent, right? So here you can see the, uh, the characters that were developed by one person, but then adapted by all the other students so that the work can happen simultaneously. It's not that the student who developed the character will work out each and every page containing that character. So it's very, very important to learn to work collaborative and in the right place at the right time. If the illustrator takes too long <coughs> and they can't put it in the layout and everyone's waiting and then there's exactly. no chance to put it together in the end. Yeah, yeah. So this was this was like a 200 page book that was produced by a team of uh, 20 students but that whole process had to begin with with brainstorming, right? And, and uh, through brainstorming, through, through ideating um, uh, they had to come up with the best possible illustration style that worked for the book. Um, just one sample page uh, showing you in a close-up here. Um, just to say that it, it just it's not just the illustrations, but they also had to draw some infographics. And these infographics also had to have their own styles, which then again worked with the overall look and feel of the book. Another very important aspect that a lot of designers are doing more and more of which is not just taking something and making it again look nice but understanding something and recreating it so that it's more easily understandable to a wide audience so simplifying complex information into a message understood by an audience and usually a specific audience so one very important way that people do this is through infographics, which is you could take something like a lot of raw data or charts and tables or lots of scholarly articles and theories and try to put them together in a way that's more visual so that you don't have to read it as far like word to word, but you can look read it as an image or as a poster. Yeah, see, infographics mostly use icons and symbols, right? And they have to convey complex information in very carefully categorized chunks of information and, and visualize this information very carefully so that a lot can be said in one poster, right? So if all this information had to be written down, you would have to read perhaps one or two pages of text. But here you just have to look at one poster 
And there it is, you know everything there is to know about carpus, right? <laughs> Very important. <laughs> These are being used a lot more. I know even five years ago, my newspaper didn't have very many, but now it has a lot because I think they know that we're not interested in reading every word in the newspaper or in a long magazine article. But maybe if we see something like this, I might get drawn into it because I see an image I like, and then I might realize I'm interested in that topic. So it's a way to draw people in to want to learn more about the topic, but also to visually organize something so it doesn't have to only be word by word. Packaging. Packaging is a very interesting project for a lot of our students. Um, but unlike, um, unlike um, other colleges where packaging is being taught as purely a branding and marketing activity, we push our students to think a little more out of the box. We ask them to again look into their environment and see what is it that they want to package. And uh, here is a student who wanted to package cutting chai, meaning tea that is poured into a cup um, from a distance, right? So, mm -hmm. so you must have seen uh, these tea vendors at the street corner um, who, who raise their cup while pouring the tea in, into the other cup, just so that tea cools down to the correct temperature. And um, so the packaging here uses the, the visual language that evokes that feeling of, of chai being poured into the cup from a distance, you know, and, and that invigorating feeling that you experience after drinking a cup of tea. Um, a lot of the times, um, packaging design does not consider the environment, and uh, we actually encourage our students to look at the environment and then only design the, the product or the packaging because it's really not needed that you employ complex printing processes using six colors, seven colors, um, foil stamping, laminating, complex die cutting. Really, I mean, you can just design your packaging in a very simple manner using simple paper and yet achieve the same effect. Because it's all designed to be thrown away anyway. So exactly. I mean, all our work ultimately ends up being a dustbin, right? Yeah. So very, one very important way, and this is a technique that many designers use, not even just graphic designers, is thumbnailing, which is a way to get you out of your kind of mental habits by very quickly making little sketches, that's why they're called thumbnails because they're supposed to be like a thumbnail, but you can, you literally have to make it slightly bigger otherwise you can't fit your pencil. Yes. So they're usually around two Not by the two size inches. of your thumb. Yeah, <laughs> but small and uh, as fast as possible. So usually you learn when you're taking regular exams that, you know, go with your first instinct that's usually right. But often with visuals, the first instinct is the same one that everybody else has. And I've seen students do 20 of these on one concept and it's only the number 17 that they end up using because they have to get all those other ideas out of their system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, never get stuck to the first idea that comes to your mind. So we have a, before we take your questions, uh, we have activity activity1.pdf uploaded here and if you would like to, this is what it looks like and if you would like to take this, um, do this activity then please just go ahead and download the document and then do it in your own time. It's kind of fun. But yeah, it is fun. But I guess we are ready to take your questions now. To clarify here on the thumbnails, it's five minutes for all five. So it's one minute per image. Don't think too hard about these. Um, okay, the question is if opted to enroll in which program to learn visual communication, how would this course run? Um, the bridge program is different than the program that we are talking about now. Um, however, you would come out with a lot of the learning capabilities that we talked about today. Correct? Yeah, so the bridge program is the step after this program. Yeah. It's if you want to transition into the master's level. This is at mm -hmm. the undergraduate yeah. level. Right, so if you're already a graduate, uh, but if you only have a three-year undergraduate uh, um, a degree or diploma, then you would have to enter our bridge program. 
um, and then enter the Masters in MDES in Visual Communication Design program. I hope that answers your question. Um, if you take the Finnish pathway, Poonam, then there is scope. Uh, I don't understand. Scope for what? Can you please explain? Is, if, is when you're going into the um, PG space. Why would you consider the PGDP program, Spoonam? Because what you're talking about, the Finnish pathway or the Bridge pathway, they are part of the PGDP, which means they are the postgraduate diploma programs. Um, they are meant for graduates who have, uh, who have studied um, a, a discipline which is not related to art and design or graduates of art and design who have done only three years of undergraduate studies. Whereas the BWOC program that we were talking about today in graphic arts and design practices um, is, is, is a program meant for undergraduate studies. So, so, gradu uh, so people who have finished 12th um, uh, and, and they could Join so, this so if, program. Yeah, if you're the if you're uh, if you have this degree in another field and you don't have experience in design, you would enter with into the bridge program. Yes, it's a kind of a it's almost like an advanced foundation for people who want to get the basics, but at a more advanced level with more mature students who are not coming in as the first year, kind of you know just after twelve. Yeah. And it does. We there are many many kinds of students there too that come from all different fields. In fact, at some points it feels like most are from other fields and they want to get into art and design, but they just haven't had the chance yet. So, yes, I guess uh, you're right in thinking that uh, if, if you're from marketing background, Puna, and, and uh, you've done your undergraduation in uh, marketing or post-graduation actually, um, and, and if you want to now become a visual communication designer, then it is important that you take the bridge program because that's where you will learn the basic skills and then you'll be able to uh, enter the uh, MDES in VC, which is a two-year program. We have a question from Prachi. Is visual communication applied in documentation rather than for as a form of expression for visual appeal? <clears throat> kind of as we were mentioning earlier, visual appeal will be there, but it can be done in so many different ways that what can be appealing to one audience will be unappealing to another. I even recently taught a class on this that maybe the signage we see on the street level will appeal to some people and others might find it ugly and vice versa or not want to look at it. So visual appeal is a very broad way. I mean, the, it will have to appeal to somebody because you want somebody to look at it. But there isn't one way to achieve that. So, uh, yeah, and documentation is a big part of it, is you're trying to take ideas, information, context, concepts, and present them visually. I don't uh, know if I you think, something. Yeah, visual communication is very important in documentation. It's very important in expression. It's very important in information. It uh, ultimately just depends on what is the context, you know, why are you designing and what are you designing and who are you designing for. And uh, once you consider why, what and who, then you know, you know, where exactly your communication is going to lie. And even many of our students in the other disciplines here who are studying furniture want to learn visual communication because they do have to show their ideas to others. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's a question uh, from Sami saying, do you see the BWOC as being more able to utilize technology? Um, I wouldn't say more or less. I mean, whatever technology is required for you to use, um, it's just so that you, you work effectively and, and that you, you, uh, you have professional working standards. Uh, you will learn that amount of technology during BWOC. 
It's more mm -hmm. the bee walk is focused on graphic arts and design rather than you can take a film course. So yeah. Yeah, uh, so the difference between our... Uh, we use one kind of technology. I yeah, guess. the difference between BeeWalk and BeeDesk would be that BeeWalk program is very focused, as Alison just um, uh, explained. Um, it's, it's focused to prepare you uh, to, uh, for the graphic design industry or the market, uh, whereas the BeeDesk program is more broad-based and uh, more navigable. Uh, so students can graduate from BDES, they would graduate with uh, multidisciplinary skills and, and then perhaps find their voice and their interest or passion. Whereas in BWOC, uh, one would want to become a graphic designer before joining. Okay, thank you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, thank you for attending and we hope to see you at Swishti soon. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.